It is my very great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Wilson Joyner as speaker for this month's Visiting Scholar Lecture. Uh, Dr. Joyner received his BSc in Biomedical Engineering from St. Louis University. Uh, he then went on to complete a PhD also in Biomedical Engineering uh, at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Uh, he did postdoctoral fellowships at Harvard University and the National Eye Institute. Currently, Dr. Joyner is an associate professor in the Department of Neurobiology, Physiology, and Behavior in the College of Biological Sciences, as well as in the Department of Neurology in the School of Medicine at the University of California, Davis. Uh, his research studies processes and neural underpinnings of sensory motor integration in visual perception, motor learning, and their applications in rehabilitation. Um, I can say that I have been uh, an avid reader of Dr. Joyner's work for many years, and it's a great pleasure for me to sort of virtually meet him today. Um, uh, so I'm very excited to have him here with us today, and uh, so I'd like to extend a hearty welcome and hope you'll join me in doing so. And with that, I will turn the floor over. Well, well. I, want, I want to thank Amanda uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk to you this afternoon. That was, that was a very kind introduction, thank you. Um, uh, some of the work that I'm going to present was done at my, my previous institution uh, before UC Davis at George Mason University in close collaboration with my, one of my colleagues there, Dr. Siddhartha Sikdar and his lab. Um, and the most recent studies that I'm going to also talk about with, with kids were done in collaboration with colleagues here at UC Davis and, uh, and, and Shriners Hospital in, in Sacramento. And before I, before I start, I should also say that, you know, I've, I've given a couple of um, presentations over Zoom and I have to admit that I'm somewhat out of practice now um, with everything kind of shifting back to in person. And there was one one presentation I gave where I was on mute the whole time and I didn't realize until the end. So if there's any issue or if there's any you know questions, please, please interrupt me and uh, um, I'll, I'll definitely try to, to answer them or address them as quickly as I can. So I thought um, I would start with just a, a very brief um, history of, of prosthetics. Um, prosthetics have been around for, for quite a while. Um, perhaps the first uh, a kind of a functional working prosthetic was from the, the 15th or the 16th uh, century. There was a knight that lost his hand when he was around his early 20s. And uh, he worked, um, or at least he, he built himself a, uh, a functional uh, hand to basically hold a sword, I think work with, with springs. And he used this, um, this hand for quite a while. So he used it until his I think mid 60s um, to, to fight with. And you know, this is, every year this gets a little bit more and more outdated, but if you were, as a, if you were as invested in the show as I was, this probably reminds you, reminds you of uh, a certain um, Kingslayer from Westeros, um, Jamie Lannister. So the, the parallels there I always, I always find kind of funny. Um, moving on from you know, this example, when we go to the American Civil War, that triggered um, another effort to develop better prosthetic devices. These were body power. So you had tension belts, and as, uh, as, as a patient or a subject basically flexed and extended the shoulder, it directly controlled the opening and closing of the hand. And when you get to the 1970s, um, roughly, you have these electrically um, uh, electromechanical um, devices that are much more advanced and that can control the joints um, of these hands and these limbs. So there's been significant progress that's been made in design in the degrees of freedom in these really um, complex multi-articulate um, arms. However, even with all that advancement, you know, these, these devices are, um, they continue to be a very complex motor learning, uh, motor learning problem. Even simple tasks can be extremely difficult uh, to complete. Here's a rather extreme example. This was a video borrowed from the Laboratory for Bionic Integration from the, the Cleveland Clinic. So, so this is a subject and they have a fairly simple task. They, they just need to place these pins uh, along this along this rod, so you can see that she's you know trying to maneuver the, the device over the pins and, and basically you know clamp down to to pick them up, and the arm is doing some fairly um, unnatural things, and that and that makes it very difficult to to learn how to use this device. In fact, I think in about a couple of seconds you're going to see the arm, no, the hand actually do a complete 360 once she 
um, places that pin on the on the rod. Right, right there. So you know these are our natural movements, and it makes this a, a very largely uh, non-intuitive control method to master. So there's you know somewhat of an extreme amount of difficulty in controlling these devices. However, it doesn't have to be this way. Um, you know, there, there are other cases where it's very natural to use these devices. So, so this is a, um, another example. Um, this is Isabella. At the time um, that I met her, she was a 10 year old um, student in Northern Virginia at my previous institution. And she was born without a left, um, a left hand with only a partial bone in her left elbow and um, uh, her wrist. So she and her mom approached Mason, approached George Mason, the bioengineering department, um, because she wanted to learn how to play the violin. And she wanted the prosthetic um, to basically allow her to do that. So I had a senior design team that was up for that challenge and, and built her a prosthetic arm. Um, they spent a tremendous amount of time with the, with the music department, learning how, how to actually play a violin, the mechanics of it. Um, they, they built her this um, uh, the prosthetic arm after numerous iterations. Her favorite color was pink, so they, they painted it pink. And, and she was able to play the violin. And actually, here's, if I can get it to play, here's a video of the finished prosthetic and her playing the violin. Right, so that, that's pretty good, right? And that's not a very sophisticated device. That was something that we, we 3D printed um, you know, down the hall in our, in our building. And, and she's able to use that quite well. In fact, um, the, uh, let's see, the Washington Post um, had a story about her and, and the senior design team um, up for, for quite a bit um, because it was such a very interesting and somewhat interest, in, inspirational story. So, so it doesn't have to be um, difficult. Part of the issue, or at least we think um, somewhat part of the issue is that um, the control aspect of the device is, is really difficult to learn. So usually these devices use um, EMG signals, so electrical um, activity signals from the residual muscles, and they use something called um, velocity or direct control. So basically you have to get the activity, the, SA, um, the EMG activity over a threshold for the device to, to kind of actuate. Not in all cases, but in, in most cases. So, so in this example, you know, when the arm is at rest, when the muscles are at rest, the prosthetic, you know, down here is in this in, in this state. And if you flex, no, sorry, if you extend the, um, the muscles, if you activate the muscles, you will open up the prosthetic. However, if you want to basically maintain that open state, if you want to, you know, keep the, uh, the prosthetic at a open position, you then have to go back to relaxing. So you have to basically cease the activity. You have to go below that threshold for the, the prosthetic to basically be in the state of, um, um, of open with no, no further movement of prosthetic. So right there, there's, there's an issue, right? There's a difference in the states of the muscles. The, the muscles are actually relaxed, but the prosthetic itself is actually in this, this other state. It's not um, actually um, you know, in this, this kind of limp, um, you know, non-active state. It's actually in this you know, about to like basically grip something or hold something. So um, when you want to go back to a close, you have to move the muscles, um, activate the, the opposite muscles, the flexors, to basically close the prosthetic device. So this control really limits the ability to achieve um, dexterous manipulation of a, of a device, of a prosthetic device. Users usually grip objects um, with excessive force um, compared to able-bodied individuals. The control signal is also not really congruent with proprioceptive. So like I said, you know, the muscles are in one state, whereas the prosthetic is in a different state. So that really makes it non-intuitive, fairly difficult um, to learn how to use. Um, when these, you know, the muscles that you're actually using to power the device or control the device is in a different state than the prosthetic. Um, you know, to give you, again, a, a fairly good um, sense of, you know, that difficulty, or at least that, that non-intuitive um, sense of that, here is a patient, um, this is a patient from UC Davis. And in this video, you'll get an idea of how non-intuitive um, the control is. So there's a prosthetist that's basically coaching um, this patient on how to, to use this um, prosthetic hand. He's, he's a newly, um, uh, somewhat newly um, um, new amputee. So he's really beginning to learn how to use this device. And you can hear this conversation between the prosthetist and the patient. And it's really at the end where there's a question that the, the patient's going to ask the, the prosthetist that I like you to pay attention to. And I'm gonna to try to turn it up so that you can hear it. Great job, Venus. 
Yes. That works. Oh, good. Okay, so <laughs> that was, uh, I apologize for that. So if you, if you heard that, his question at the end was, was really, um, you know, making sure, you know, if I stop, then the, the hand's going to stop at this position. And then, you know, just the, that question, I think is really um, a good example of like, this is not something that people, you know, coming straight in, it's intuitive for them to learn, intuitive for them to basically um, kind of sort out. And that I think makes it difficult you know, to use these devices. Now, having that difficulty results in several negative consequences um, for users of prosthetics. So um, there are a number of people in the US and, uh, and around the world that rely on prosthetics. The most common um, loss of upper limb is transradial. So that means between the, um, the elbow and the, and the wrist. Um, the majority, or at least, you know, quite a few of these, um, uh, these users um, of, of upper limb prosthetics um, they prefer very basic ones. So they basically stop using, um, you know, these really advanced myoelectric um, prosthetics, and they really prefer a body power device or maybe one for just purely cosmetic reasons. So they, they the abandonment rate is, is fairly high. Um, the majority of non-users say that it's mentally taxing to use. You know, the the example we just saw with the uh, with the one patient. It's very difficult to keep these things straight about like what you have to do in order to to control these devices. So mentally taxing to use. However, the majority of these people um, that abandon the device because you know it's, it's so taxing, the majority of them would say that they would use a device that was more friendly and intuitive to operate. So if there was improvement in how you basically can use these devices, um, you could really help um, a vast majority of the people that abandon these prosthetics. Ultrasound imaging, um, we think may be um, a way of assisting um, to, to find a solution to this problem. Uh, this type of imaging can visualize the main muscles and their functional compartments in the forearm. Uh, and sonomography is basically used the, the real-time change of muscle um, architectural parameters using ultrasound um, to, to look at these de deformations. So basically look at the activation of muscles, how they basically change when um, folks are activating. Um, these muscles is much like looking at, you know, um, heart function. Um, if you've ever been, you know, had an ultrasound of your heart, um, we have three kids. So we've, we've seen, you know, our, our kids um, developing. So, you know, you're basically looking at these, these changes in the muscle architecture as they, uh, you know, contract and relax. To give you an example of, of how we use ultrasound um, in our studies, here are two videos. Um, there's one video of, uh, the index finger flexion, so flexion of the index finger. The other one is the, um, the flexion of the, of the middle finger. And this is an ultrasound of the, the cross section of the forearm during these, um, during these motions. Here is um, some landmarks to kind of orient you, some anatomic um, landmarks. So you can see the bones in the forearm, the, um, the ulna and the, and the radius. You can see um, some of the nerves um, and the muscle compartments. And what I'd like for you to pay attention to is the median nerve. So here's the, the median nerve for the, the left finger flexion. Um, here's the median nerve for the, the middle finger flexion. And as the subjects are doing these two, you know, um, different motions, um, these two distinct fingers, um, if you pay attention where the median nerve goes, you can see that there are specific, um, you know, changes um, to those motions. So in one case, you know, the median nerve is moving and uh, it stopped in one direction, whereas the, uh, the median nerve is moving in a, in a different uh, direction for the, the middle finger flexion. So it's easy, if the, if the index uh, finger flexion video kept playing, it's easy to visually appreciate that there are clear differences in the activation of these, um, these two motions. And these specific spatial temporal patterns of muscle deform uh, deformations during these motions um, are associated with different movements. So if you can basically you know, capture the, um, the spatial temporal changes um, during these, these different motions, you can categorize them, you can, you can characterize them as you know, this is the intended motion um, or the intended movement um, of, a, of a subject. And that's exactly what we do. 
so we can use that information. We can use the ultrasound information to basically decode movement intent. So, so subjects are um, instrumented with a, a portable uh, clinical ultrasound system, something that you can, you can buy easily. Um, from these real-time images, um, we shrink and filter um, each frame. So we shrink and filter each frame. We, we go from um, fairly large um, picture, a thousand by a thousand pixels, um, something that's, that's fairly compact, um, 128 by 128 pixels. Um, and then over consecutive frames, so we can look over consecutive frames, where are the pixels changing the most? Where are we getting the most change in this, in this image of the, of the forearm? And we can create basically a QR code um, that represents that intended motion. So we can, we can basically threshold and say like everything um, above this threshold, um, you know, we'll, we'll make white. Um, so we'll represent this where the greatest changes are occurring in the image and anything below that we'll, we'll make black. And so we have this QR code that represents a specific motion. In this case, um, the example I'm showing here is a, a power grass. And then when you have enough of these um, QR codes, when you have enough information of these different motions, you can start to categorize them or at least like sort them out into what is the intended motion um, of the subject. We can basically go to a library and basically figure out, all right, for this given motion coming in, what is it most closest to in terms of what we know already what this representation should be. So we can use a machine learning algorithm, um, supervised learning algorithm, to uh, use a k-nearest neighbor classifier to code the movement intent. Um, the more information we have, the more you know, information we can add to this, the better um, this, this algorithm can be in decoding um, motor intent. So we continually adjust its performance over time, giving more information. Um, and you can treat each muscle state, each grasp, um, pattern like a unique QR code. So a unique QR code that represents um, that given motion. We can use that to um, code motion intent. I should also say that, you know, the time it takes to train subjects to do this um, is fairly small. So we're, we're talking about maybe 10 to 30 minutes at the most. So it, it's a very short process to get this kind of information and start decoding um, uh, motion intent. Here is an example from a um, prosthetic user an adult. Um, so in this video, you're going to see um, the patient um, with an ultrasound probe right on the residual muscles there. And she's going to state the motion she intends to perform in a virtual hand, which we're displaying on the screen, is going to show the decoded motion. So I will play this. Oh, too loud. <laughs> So she can go through, you know, these different motions and we can decode them based on the ultrasound signals that we are um, uh, obtaining. And we did an expanded study of this. So we looked at able-bodied subjects and uh, several prosthetic users. So here are the results for the able-bodied subjects. And this is a confusion uh, matrix. So the intended motions are here on the x-axis and the predicted motions. So what we are actually decoding is on the y-axis, and this is giving you a sense of how well are we actually, you know, decoding um, the intended motions um, based on our, our algorithm. And you can see for the able-bodied subjects, we're doing pretty good. So um, the for the five motions that we were going through, um, we're getting an accuracy of around 96% um, accuracy in terms of decoding, probably decoding um, the intended motion and the uh, the predicted motion. That's all fine and good. These are these are able-bodied subjects that shouldn't be terribly difficult. Um, of course, the interesting thing is when we look at prosthetic users. So these are folks, these are adults, I should also say. These are adults that have um, either had some traumatic injury, um, that's, a, that's a middle column, or had a congenital limb deficiency. Um, so they, in, in either case, they were born, um, sorry, in either case, they, they don't have a hand. And we're decoding the motion intent. So, you know, these different uh, grass patterns in the hand based on these um, ultrasound signals. And for the subjects with the traumatic amputation, you can see that we are, again, doing a fairly good job. Um, similar to the results obtained from the um, able-bodied subjects, we're looking at 96% accuracy across the five motions um, that we are trying to decode for the four subjects with these uh, traumatic um, amputations. Note here, though, that the, the key grasp and point are motions that are relatively difficult to distinguish. So you can see, you know, there's some difficulty in basically um, uh, accurately classifying these motions um, and what they were intended to be. Um, 
In addition, the congenital subject is showing about 85% accuracy, so some, somewhat less than what we saw for the traumatic amputation. And that raises some interesting questions about, you know, what does it mean to have had a hand and then have, have unfortunately lost that hand, as opposed to never having a hand, you know, congenitally um, from the beginning. Um, what does that mean in terms of the control? What does that mean in terms of um, your ability to decode these motions? That's a very interesting question and something that we're trying to address with the kids, which I'm going to talk about, I think, in, in just a little bit. So these are the results that we've obtained with, um, with adult subjects. At Strider's Hospital, we're trying to look at um, kids. So these are, these, are, um, these are kids with a congenital um, limb deficiency. So we've recently um, extended the work with adults to children in collaboration with Shriners Children's Hospital. The children we examined have a unilateral congenital below elbow deficiency. So they're lacking a hand. They have one, they have one typical um, developing um, limb and they have another limb where unfortunately, um, because it's congenital condition, they're lacking a hand. And the kids vary from five to 17 years um, of age. And we've done the same kinds of experiments the same kind of studies um, with these kids at, at Shriners. So here is an example of, of one subject. Um, this is a 10 year old um, subject. And you can, you can see that they perform pretty well. The, the confusion matrix is, is roughly the same as what we saw before for the adults. You have you know, the predicted um, motion and the actual motion um, in this confusion matrix. And we're able to classify these motions quite well. And again, it's important to remember this child has never actuated a hand in this limb. So there's no, there's no hand or no representation, we think, um, that they should remember of what it was like to actually do these different grass patterns, but they, able, they are able to do this very distinctly across these, different, um, these five different um, motions. So again, the unique thing about these um, children is that they have one typical upper limb and one that unfortunately lacks a hand. And therefore we can actually test both limbs. So we can actually compare the performance um, to their intact limb. And that is what we, um, that we did, and that's what we're, that's what I'm showing here. So here are the the six motions that we tested. the The radial distance here is the accuracy. So what is the the accuracy of our of our classification? The blue um, uh, hexagon, I guess, um, or yeah, hexagon represents the affected limb. So the one that's lacking a hand, and the red represents the um, unaffected limb. And you can see there's quite a you know fair bit of overlap between the affected the unaffected limb. And the performance is, is roughly the same, which is which is really, you know, quite interesting. This is a um, again the results for our ten year old subject. We had a range of ages that we tested. So this is ten. Um, here's someone who's slightly older. This is twelve. Um, again, you can see that you know the accuracy of the um, decoding of the motion intent is fairly good. Um, and again, the um, the overlap between the affected and the unaffected limb is also fairly good. So there, there's definitely similarity in performance between having an intact limb and the, um, the affected limb. Here's someone who's slightly younger. So this is eight. And again, we're seeing somewhat similar performance. So again, the classification for these different motions is quite good. And the overlap between the affected and the unaffected limb is, is fairly similar. So this is very promising and, 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 and quite interesting. And I'm gonna co come back to the kids um, later on, but um, these are some really interesting story, sorry, really interesting um, studies that we can we can do, and especially having this um, this control side that we can we can basically compare to. In addition to classifying movement, so you know I've, what I've talked about so far is you know we have these these signals and we're basically trying to decode you know what is the intent what is the intended movement um, from the signals that we're uh, we're obtaining. In addition to classifying movement, we're also interested in quantifying the control over that. What is the proportional control over these muscles in the residuum? And we designed the following um, motor control tasks to basically study this. So the subject controls a cursor, this, uh, this blue circle here, and their job is to basically move that cursor to, to different levels, different, different targets, these, this red line. The subject controls the vertical position of that cursor based on the proportional amount of activation. So they're, they're basically trying to um, enact a, a certain grasp. So let's say power grasp. Zero represents full rest. One represents full activation, so full power grasp. And we're trying to see, can they modulate that activation to go to different levels, right? Different levels of, of, of actual the, that grasp. Um, that we're actually asking them to do. So can they go to like 20%, 40% of a, of a power grasp? So for a given hand motion, 
subject had to activate the residual muscles within these limits to move the cursor to that target. We tested five able-bodied subjects in this task. We tested um, four prosthetic users, adult prosthetic users. Um, one was congenital and three were traumatic. We had five motions, so not, not in addition to um, power grasp, we also looked at um, other, other grasps. We had 11 graded targets, again, between zero and, and one. We had three trials for each, um, each target in randomized order. So they were trying to basically um, modulate their muscle activation to these different levels in some randomized, um, randomized order that we were presenting to them on the screen. Here's a video that kind of walks you through the experiment. So this is in our, uh, you know, one of our adult um, prosthetic users. You can see the ultrasound transducer is here. They're going to mimic their motion with their intact um, limb over here. Here's the uh, visual cursor control interface and the target. And here's a time series plot of their performance. So you can see, you know, they're activating um, those muscles in the residual in the residuum to move the cursor to the the target. Um, position that we're asking them to. So they're going to about 60% activation. Now they're going to 70%. Um, he hasn't yet mimicked um, his, uh, his intended motion with his uh, um, intact limb here, but eventually he will. But you can see that he's quite good at modulating the activity um, of this, you know, this power grass and the residual muscles to basically go to these different levels um, of activation. So, right, he's going to that's 100%, right? Now he's had to go to 80%. So he's able to modulate his activation um, to these different levels um, quite well. And from this you know, performance, from this, um, from this experiment, there are a number of things that we can quantify to basically get a sense of like, well, how well and how stable is this, um, is this control? So it's also the other thing I should also point out, this would be extremely difficult if it was based on um, the velocity control I kind of mentioned earlier in the presentation. So if you remember, you know, if you're if you're dealing with velocity um, control, you'd have to activate the muscles over some kind of threshold, over some some set threshold, and then that would actually move the cursor. But you'd have to anticipate, you know, reaching this cursor or sorry, the cursor reaching this um, this target to, in order to stop and have that um, have that cursor basically rest right where you want it to be in terms of the proportional. Um, activation that we're asking for. So that would be a very difficult thing to do and something that we are um, uh, currently trying to examine. Um, but this is much more um, intuitive. You know, this subject has only been using the system, I think, for maybe half an hour to an hour, and they're able to basically modulate that activity um, quite well. It'd be very difficult if we're dealing with a, a velocity-based um, control signal. I mentioned that we were, you know, there are a number of parameters that we could quantify. Um, to look at their their performance, look at their um, ability to um, modulate their um, muscle um, activation. So we required subjects again to move the cursor within a five percent bounds around the target. So once they entered this range, um, we counted this as acquiring the target. Um, the interval between um, when the target is presented and the time um, that they basically entered that that bound is the movement time. So the movement time is when they when they first enter that target um, um, from when it was presented. We examined the position error. So the position error was the mean difference between the target and the cursor position after the target was acquired. We also looked at the stability error. So the stability error was a standard deviation. So how much variability was there once the target was acquired? Were they, were they basically you know, stable or was there a lot of variability um, once they reached that target? Um, in addition, we had the, the task completion rate. So the number of targets acquired in the session um, that we were testing. Subjects had to hold at the target for 15 seconds, or there was a timeout after 30 seconds. So we 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 quickly we could quickly move um, between these different targets that we're asking them to um, basically move to. And again, they were supposed to hold at that different um, activation level, that that target position, for 15 seconds. Here's an example um, of this task uh, for two two different um, two different subjects. One is congenital, um, and, and one is traumatic. So the congenital um, uh, subject, you can see it's a power grasp. So they're, they're doing a power grasp to basically um, move the target, sorry, move the cursor to these different targets. The position error is roughly 8%. Stability error is um, 20%, but they're able to complete this um, quite well. They're able to reach all the targets um, at 100%. The green uh, markers are the mean position during the required, that required hold period. And the red vertical line is a standard deviation of the position error 
uh, of the position over that um, over that time. So you can see that there are some targets where there's a, a fairly large um, stability error, and there's some where it's fairly small. Um, there's also, you know, the position error is also fairly big for some of these um, larger or at least farther away um, targets, and then um, quite accurate for for others. That's a congenital um, patient. Here's um, the results for a traumatic um, subject. And you can see the position errors are much smaller for the subject. So instead of 8%, it's almost 0%. Stability errors are also about half um, for the traumatic um, subject. But again, the task completion rate is 100%. So they're able to reach all these different um, um, activation levels that we required. So I wanted to point this out because again, some interesting questions about like, you know, having a hand and unfortunately losing it as opposed to never having a hand. What does that mean in terms of the control of these muscles and you know for these um, these um, grass patterns that we're, we're asking uh, folks to basically um, enact? Here's a summary um, for all the subjects that we tested, so we can look at the the overall um, performance for the able-bodied subjects and for the prosthetic users. Um, here, the white bar represents the mean across the able-bodied subjects. Um, the gray are the amputee subjects, so the the prosthetic users. And the other bars, um, right, are the individual um, prosthetic users. All the all the gray bars are the um, prosthetic users. You can see that certain motions were difficult for both the able-bodied subjects and the prosthetic users. So here I'm plotting, or here we're plotting the um, position error for these five different um, motions. So there are some uh, motions that were difficult um, for both the able-bodied subjects to do and for the prosthetic users. Um, that was true for the position error. Um, in terms of the position error, it's also true for the stability error. So the same motions that had um, difficulty um, in terms of the position error also tended to have um, difficulty in terms of stability error. In fact, it was key grasp, um, power grasp, and, and tripod that exhibited the highest um, mean stability and position errors for both subject groups. So I can go um, back and forth between the position error and the stability error. And these are these tended to have the, the highest position errors and stability errors. However, across the different grass patterns, so across you know, the five um, grass patterns that we tested, um, the position and stability errors were still fairly low. So they were respectively 3.5% um, uh, and 12.1% and respectively um, for the position and stability error. So even though there was some difficulty, their errors were, were quite low. So they were able to do this task um, you know, quite well I and mean, com you know, somewhat comparable to um, the able-bodied subjects. In terms of the movement time, so that is the time between when a, um, a target appeared and how long it took for that subject to acquire that target, um, the movement time increased with tax difficulty. So as the distance that we were requiring them to move to increased, the movement time increased. That's not, that's not surprising. But this was very similar to what we saw for the able-bodied subjects. So there was really no difference um, between the able-bodied subjects and the prosthetic users um, in, terms of, in terms of this relationship between movement time and, and basically distance or we call it the, the index of difficulty. Over the 11 graded targets, so over these different target positions um, that we're asking um, subjects to move to, um, the average completion rate was greater than 94%. So if we look at all the different um, uh, target um, uh, graded target positions, the average completion rate was, was fairly high, 94%. However, the completion rate did vary by the required target distance. So if we were asking, um, able subjects or the um, prosthetic users to go to very low, um, you know, low distances or small distances or very high um, distances, very high proportion in terms of their motion range. That's where they had difficulty. That's where this definitely um, fell off. So here um, and up here. So a complete relaxation or, you know, uh, full um, activation. That's where it's fairly difficult um, for the, uh, the completion rate um, to, be, to be fairly high. Um, however, despite that, you know, our subjects are fairly on par with the, um, the able-bodied subjects. So there is um, comparable performance between these prosthetic users um, and, and our able-bodied subjects. These were all the adults. Um, this was all done in adults um, so far. And this, again, was, this was published in, in 2019. Recently, we are now working with um, the collaborators at Shriners to do the same kind of task <coughs> with the kids um, that, I kinda, that I showed you earlier in terms of um, decoding their, their motion intent. So this is one of my graduate students. You can, you can barely see, but there's a task right there um, where he's, he's trying to basically control um, uh, that cursor and go to these different activation levels. And again, despite not having a hand, uh, not being born um, with a hand, 
we have found similar performance um, with, with the kids that we've been testing, that they are able to modulate the activity um, of these residual muscles quite well and, and basically move between these different levels that we're requiring to. So I wanted to do a, a brief summary here and then talk about some of the, the current um, uh, things that we've been looking into and, and some of the future directions. So in summary, cinematography um, uses ultrasound imaging uh, to detect real-time changes in the, in the muscle shape, the deformations of these uh, residual muscles. With little training, so less than 30 minutes, um, cinematography is able to discriminate motions with a robust um, specificity in individuals with limb loss. This includes both adults and children. Um, it also includes both traumatic and, and congenital um, uh, limb deficiencies. So um, it's, a, it's a fairly robust way of um, discriminating motions and, and really decoding um, motion intent. Importantly, children with congenital limb differences um, are able to execute several distinct hand grasps despite never having um, controlled an intact hand. So despite never having a hand, they're able to um, you know, execute these very distinct um, uh, hand grasps. Um, when applied to the upper limb residual, these signals provide direct mapping between uh, the extent of muscle deformations in the external device. So that, that, uh, that task that I showed you um, just now, where they're controlling the, the cursor to these different um, target uh, positions, they're able to modulate um, the activation of those muscles quite well. And the mapping between these is, is fairly intuitive in that, again, the training on this um, the system on this um, using these control signals is very minimal. And they're able to, to modulate their activity and get to these different activation levels um, quite easily. Um, these proportional control signals may provide an intuitive um, motor control interface for prosthetics, um, allowing the control over multiple degrees of freedom. And that's, um, that's what we're working towards. Um, so in terms of the current and future directions, you know, towards that goal, um, I wanted to highlight a couple of things. So one is, you know, um, based on these promising results, um, uh, Siddhartha's group at Mason, um, in, in collaboration with, with us at um, UC Davis, are, are looking at using these cinematography uh, signals to control prosthetic hands like the ones commercially available. So, so here's an example where you have, you know, the uh, ultrasound sensor on the residual um, muscles of uh, the affected limb, and he's going through different grass patterns, and we're decoding those, and basically, um, this is a um, commercially available prosthetic, um, basically controlling, you know, um, that prosthetic with those uh, those decoded signals. So he's going through right point, grasp, uh, power grasp, um, all the all the various uh, grass patterns that I've already talked about. Um, in addition to decoding different grass patterns and using um, prosthetics um, to enact that, we can also look at proportional control. So, you know, much like that motor control task where they're going to different levels of, of, of activation, here he's mimicking with his um, unaffected limb the different um, proportional amounts of power grass that he's um, actually um, enacting in his uh, um, affected limb. And again, that's being, um, that's using, that's being used to control this uh, commercially available um, prosthetic device. So we've, we've had you know, some success in using these um, sonography signals to control um, external device. Of course, these are very bulky, um, you know, relatively very bulky um, transducers and sensors. So we have to reduce the, um, the size of them to actually be able to use them in a prosthetic device. And that is something that Siddhartha's group is, um, is actively, if not you know, um, probably accomplished already. Um, they've miniaturized these um, ultrasound transducers to basically um, obtain the same types of information um, that these uh, fairly larger um, ultrasound transducers have um, been providing and getting the same kind of signals, same kind of decoding uh, different motion uh, grass patterns that we, we saw um, before. And in fact, a plug for Siddhartha's paper, uh, this was, it was May, right? So this was just within a little over a month, I guess. Um, they had a, a paper published in Frontiers, um, basically showing the first demonstration of, uh, of using these signals to, uh, to control prosthetic. So they, they've definitely um, advanced, um, you know, beyond just these, this demonstration of just, uh, you know, controlling a, uh, a prosthetic limb and that they are actually doing functional tasks. So box, blocks and, can never get this right, box and blocks, there it is, 
and uh, you know other other tasks that show the the functionality of, of using the signal to, to control prosthetic. In addition to this, you know there are countless questions that you can ask about you know what does it mean to to not have a hand but to be able to control you know control those muscles to basically do these different um, these different grass patterns, and that's a question that we're asking with the kids. So you know I showed you the results um, of, of some of the kids that we've tested so far where we were able were able to um, decode their intent their their motion intent from the ultrasound signals and how similar that is to um, their intact limb. And that's a, a very unique um, uh, way of studying um, control and what it means to you know, have a hand versus, versus not have a hand. So we're trying to expand these studies um, with the kids that we were seeing at Shriners to include um, imaging. So there's been um, some really nice work um, from uh, uh, Tamar Macon's lab at the um, University of College of London, I believe, um, where, where she's looked at able-bodied subjects, um, uh, subjects that had acquired um, limb, limb difference and also congenital. And she's, she's showing some, some interesting results in terms of their representation um, in such a motor cortex um, for the individual um, fingers. And you can obviously see like, you know, the separation for able-bodied um, is quite, quite distinct and acquired, it's, it's somewhat, you know, smaller for congenital, there's, there's much more of an overlap, at least not as a distinct um, separation. And one of the things that we are interested in, in in looking at the kids is like, well, you know, when they're trying to activate these different grass patterns, like what does that look like for one limb compared to the other? How similar they are? Are they? Um, the, the other thing that we can also look at is the development. So, you know, I said that we were looking at kids from, from five um, to 17. So how does that ability, how does that discrimin uh, discrimination um, between these different grass patterns in terms of the, the neural representation, in terms of the control, how does that vary um, as a function of age? Um, one of the studies that we are currently trying to do is to expand beyond the Sacramento Shriners Hospital to include, I think, three or four other Shriners Hospitals that see a number of these kids too, to really increase the number of, of subjects that we can look at, to really look at these differences um, across age, to look at these differences between um, you know, how long have you used a prosthetic? Does that, you know, have any um, implication in terms of the, the representation and also the control? There are, there are countless questions um, that we have and that we're trying to address, but again, um, building the infrastructure to really um, have enough subjects to, to uh, enough power to really address those questions is a challenge, but it's one that we're trying to, um, one that we're trying to answer. So, so that's, that's second. And then the, the third, that should have happened. But um, <laughs> uh, the third is that um, we are working with um, uh, a number of surgeons at UC Davis, um, adult prosthetic users, to look at a, um, a specific case um, of, um, of amputees. So these are subjects that have had um, what's called a um, targeted muscle reinnervation surgery. So the, actually, the subject that I that I showed way in the beginning of the presentation that had the um, the confusion over you know if I stop the device stops he is a um, a TMR um, uh, uh, patient and the surgery is used um, to basically take the nerves um, uh, from a the residual muscles um, to to reduce pain take those nerves and basically um, denerve them so basically take them from you know where they have embedded. And basically replace them, or at least um, to place them in um, different muscles, and it's to reduce pain, um, to basically uh, avoid having neuromas. So to basically have, you know, avoid having this um, uh, uninhibited um, or disorganized axonal growth that, that really results in a lot of pain. So they basically um, take these these nerves and re reimplant them um, somewhere else. And if this video should have played. There it is. Um, and this results in very unique muscle activation patterns. You imagine like, you know, these nerves weren't meant to be in these muscles, but now they've been implanted there to reduce the pain and they, they result in very unique um, muscle activation patterns. And to give you a sense, nope, not that. So, so this is that same, same subject. He's, he's mimicking um, the different muscle activation patterns um, in his um, unaffected limb, um, what he's actually trying to um, uh, accomplish in his Affected limb, and you could see, you know, 
in that residual, uh, the residuum, there's these very unique muscle activation patterns that are that are taking place as he's trying to do these very um, specific grasp patterns and you know finger finger movements, and that's something that we we're very interested in studying. Um, and because of surgery, there's a recovery period. We're trying to also examine how does this control and how does this representation, um, I should really say repre not representation, but control, how does that control change over the recovery period, um, resulting in these very unique um, muscle activation patterns? And can we decode that in terms of you know, the, the intended motion? And can we use, again, those for um, building better prosthetic devices, specifically for these subjects? Because again, these nerves, um, are re innervated to reduce pain, not so much to provide a, 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 you know, a robust interface for a prosthetic, but with ultrasound, we should be able to decode those muscle, those um, motion intentions to um, hopefully have an intuitive um, prosthetic um, for these patients. I think that is the third one. Yes, that's the third one. So in, uh, to wrap things up, um, I, I definitely want to acknowledge um, quite a few people. So first is my um, my close collaborator, Siddhartha Strikdar at um, George Mason. Um, his lab did all of the adult work um, that I presented um, in this presentation. Here are his students, Anya Shwanavas, Bizwarp, and, uh, and Nima. So um, definitely want to acknowledge um, their fantastic work here. Um, the, the work with um, the kids has been with my close collaborator at UC Davis, um, Dr. John Schofield. Um, and also our collaborators, our close collaborators at, um, at Shriners Hospital, which we would not have been able to do it with without um, uh, Dr. Michelle James and Dr. Um, Anita Bagley. And also I should recognize the, the graduate students that have been involved in this project. So that is um, my graduate student, uh, Justin Fitzgerald, who was in that one video that I showed with the proportional task with the, with the kids and Marcus, um, who is um, John's graduate student, um, who's done a lot of the, uh, 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 collaborative um, and supportive EMG work um, in addition to the ultrasound work. I'd also like to acknowledge the um, our funding sources, so um, you know the sources that actually supported this work, so the Department of Defense um, and uh, the National Science Foundation. And I think that is the last slide I have. So I will I will stop here and take any questions. I apologize for the the issue with the um, the the sound before that was that was disappointing, but I learned something new on how to fix that. So that that's good. Um, but that is, uh, I'll take any questions that you may have. Thank you for your presentation. This is uh, Alberto Scanasi. I happen to be uh, a rehabilitation physician, a prosthetic user, and uh, later in life, uh, amputee. Uh, and uh, I, I wonder if, uh, you could tell us a little bit more about uh, the differential between um, the use of myoelectric uh, control speed compared to your proposed system. Um, it appeared to me that there was a delay in the signal generation and the activation. Um, and if there's something that drives me nuts is the delay in you know, generating a signal and having a closure. Yes. Uh, so, you're, so you're absolutely right. There, there is, there's a delay. Um, one of the things that, um, one of the things that John, um, I should say, is, is an expert at, is this idea of embodiment, and and how that that plays a role in terms of control. So, like, you know, do you feel that this um, this device is actually something that's under your control, or is it something separate, or something that you know is is not really um, a direct um, extension of your intentions, and there's definitely some some studies that we're doing where we're looking at exactly what you're you're suggesting that that delay like what is a what is a reasonable or even not even a reasonable what what is a effective um, delay that we can get away with where you can still have reasonable control and um, you know um, the ability to to really do these kind of tasks. So most of the studies um, I think that I've shown so far today were using a tremendous amount of information. So I, I don't think that they were really streamlining, like, you know, how much of this image do we actually need to go through in order to have a control signal? So you can imagine that there's gonna be, um, you know, certain, certain parts of that image that are actually most relevant, or at least the most important. You don't really need the whole image to, to really, um, you know, start decoding or have this proportional control. So something that Siddhartha has done is definitely looked at that um, and really, 
really tried to, to streamline and, and really reduce down how much of this image and how much faster can we get at decoding um, these images and using proportional um, signals. The, the, um, the pro not proposal, but the, the study that I mentioned um, towards the end that we're trying to increase our numbers with Miners Hospital is specifically trying to look at um, you know, the parameters that we're using um, both in terms of the EMG, so so I should have said that you know in conjunction with the um, the ultrasound um, studies with these kids, we're also doing EMG, and we're trying to look at all these different parameters of how can we reduce the time um, in terms of the control. So can we can we get this down to you know tens of milliseconds as opposed to like hundreds of milliseconds, and what's the most relevant, and how does that change across age, and how does that change in these different um, you know parameters, any kind of parameter space that you can kind of think of. So, so you're absolutely right. It's a, it's a, it is a problem. It's something that we are trying to address, um, not just in terms of, you know, you know, this idea of performance, but also this idea of of embodiment, which which I find, you know, really interesting. Um, again, John's the expert, but but still, this, this idea of embodiment and like the delays and how that feeds into your ability to control the devices, I think, is is something that needs to be addressed, and it's something that we are actively trying to do. Thank you for that. I, I would just add that, you know, in the, uh, I, I was not here, but in the late 1970s, Moss Rehab was the first place where a pattern recognition prosthesis um, was developed. Uh, and that was a collaboration with uh, Philco, uh, Philco Ford, who used to make the radios for Philco. They were here in Philadelphia. And so they um, developed uh, a collaboration with Moss. And um, uh, it, uh, I recently found a short video of that. And uh, it's pretty amazing to see, it was a movie that was translated into a video, uh, you know, a digital video. And it's pretty amazing to see that uh, they could use in the seventies, uh, very slow computing, computer processing systems, but they were able to create an algorithm that allowed them to determine uh, intention uh, mm -hmm. out of this pattern recognition. So. Um, I, uh, I encourage you to look them up. Uh, and I think the, the uh, name was Finley, Ray Finley. Ray uh, Finley. So if you find some of that, if not, uh, maybe someone in the Institute can help you find uh, some information, but it was pretty amazing to see that uh, going all the way back to the 1970s. I was, I was gonna say two things. One, if that video can be shared, I'd be really interested in seeing it. Um, and, and two, I didn't want to give the impression that ultrasound is the only solution. I think so. Um, the thing that I, the thing that we're still trying to um, uh, develop and, and and analyze is the simultaneous um, uh, capture of the ultrasound imaging and EMG. And I think it's really going to take both. I mean, and this is not just my idea. Siddhartha, I think John also would agree. It's really going to take both to build. Um, the most intuitive device that you can, because there's there's absolutely um, benefits of the EMG signals as well. Um, I think it depends on what your um, what your que well, question is, but what are you trying to accomplish in terms of the prosthetic yeah. device? Yeah. Thank you again. It was a lovely presentation. I I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. We have questions. <laughs> Just a quick question, Dr. Joyner. Thank you for a great presentation. Dylan Edwards here. Um, a practical question. I, I'm really curious about the detection of the tendons and, um, and you know, changes over time with muscle atrophy, muscle hypertrophy, muscle retraction, these kind of things. So just sort of practically, how does, what happens to the, the distal end of those tendons? It's, does it change with time where you're recording from? The validity of the tech thing. So that that is a very good question. Um, so I think um, it's the best way I can answer that. The I don't think that these techniques, and this is this is something that um, Siddhartha and and John and I have I think have talked at length about. The you know these these ultrasound techniques I think um, are very you know tractable way of looking at. Um, muscle activation patterns and you know motion intent and and I, I think a patient population um, where it's difficult to to quantify that. But I think there are a number of 
motor control um, questions and, and questions in general about the motor system that ultrasound is in a unique place to give us some, some real insight. Um, I think your question is not something that we've directly addressed or something that we've directly looked at, but it's along the lines of things that I think, you know, beyond, you know, control signals, beyond, um, you know, building better prosthetics, there are just fundamental things about the motor system that would be, you know, interesting to, to look at um, and try to examine. So I don't have a direct answer for your, your question. It's definitely something that, you know, once we have, I, I, can, I can point to the, the TMR patients, once we have, you know, um, uh, subjects in general that can come in and that we can systematically, you know, test over multiple days, months, um, I think those are the kind of things that we should be asking, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm hopeful that we can. Um, so perhaps, you know, if I was invited again, I, I would have a more direct answer for your question, but it is, but I should say that, um, you know, it's a very good question. It's something that I think we do have the ability to look at and it's something that we should be looking at um, examining. Thank you. Very impressive. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have an open next week. You can come back next week. Will you have an answer then? Um, so another question here. Hey, well, um, so here. I was I was interested in um, in sort of how you train your model. Um, I was curious about how much retraining you have to do what, for each new person that you put the prosthetic on, and um, how do you actually do that if they don't have a hand and you can't really confirm that they are sort of intending to make the movement you want them to. So I could take this the second question first. So so one thing I, I should have said is like we, we can use um is it I think it's mirror therapy. So so that you know when you mirror what you're trying to accomplish in your unaffected limb with the um with the uh with the affected limb, that's one way that you can at least have some insight on in what they're attempting to do. Um so you have you know some congruence of like, right, this is this is power grass. Um this is what you're trying to do and you're mimicking with the uh, um, with the affected limb. So so that is one thing I, I guess I wasn't, I didn't show um, throughout the presentation. So hopefully that, that's a little bit clearer. Um, and now of course I've, I've lost the first question. Oh, the algorithm. Um, so, so first each patient or each subject um, is, so we have, a, we have an algorithm for each specific subject. That's what I should say first. Um, so there, there's a, you know, there's an algorithm for, for separate days, algorithm for separate B, um, in terms of having a, and maybe this is what, not what you're getting at, but like having like a universal, like, or at least a, a very general, um, algorithm or general model for, for everyone, you know, for right now, we probably don't have enough people, um, there, yeah, the, in, in terms of consistency, we probably don't have enough people to do something like that yet, to at least to see how valid that would be. I'm hopeful that when we can increase, especially with the kids, when we can increase those numbers by tenfold. So instead of like looking at, I think we have seven kids, instead of looking at just seven kids, if we had like 70, if we can then go through and, and figure out like, you know, these are the important parameters. These are the important um, constraints that are universal to all our, you know, all our subjects. Then I think the question that you are raising um, is much more tractable. Um, because it would be nice to not have, you know, a, a specific model or a specific um, algorithm for every subject. You know, if it was something um, generalized, um, that would be ideal. Um, and it, I think it gets at the, the question before, is just like, you know, what is the training like? Like, can you really reduce, you know, the, the amount of time it takes for people to, to be, you know, get acquainted or at least like the, to control these, um, uh, or at least have control over um, some external device with these signals. So I, th I think that's, getting at your question. Um, and I, 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 I'm sorry, I don't have a more, <laughs> a better answer for you, but we, we definitely need to have, I think more subjects before we can address um, having a more generalized approach in terms of the, in terms of the decoding or the, um, the control. Um, so again, I'm hopeful in like a year, I can answer that question more robustly. Um, but I, I want you to, I should, I should tell you that we are, we are working on it and it's something that we are, we're trying to figure out. Hi, I had a question too. Yep. Hi, I'm Laurel Buxbaum. How are you? F fantastic talk. Very, very interesting. And, and it's nice to meet you. Um, 
and this is another training question, but not about training the model, about training the people. <laughs> so um, I don't know how much experience you guys have had in working a longer term um, with any of these patients, especially I'm interested in the congenital, uh, the people with congenital limb differences, because the, the you know, sort of those maps of this, of this, you know, of accuracy, discriminability are not as, not as clean or as good in them as, as in the traumatic amputees. And we kind of wonder with more and more and more experience in using these devices and getting feedback that they're actually in fact can control them, do, do they get better so that over time? And sorry, and I have a part two. Um, and then the interesting thing to me also becomes what happens to those cortical representations um, as they get better at controlling the device, do you start to see the representation of the fingers spread apart the way they are in, in, uh, in able-bodied people? So, so those are excellent questions. Um, the, the first question is, I think in two or three of the proposal we, went, we put into Shriners Hospital um, because we wanna know that answer too. If you, if you look at um, the kids, um, let's say over three years, um, is there is is their performance better? Does it improve? Um, so 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 that exact question is what we were asking, um, and I and I, I think it's from a from a motor learning perspective, like I think that's really interesting. Um, when it comes to the cortical representation, um, that's that's exactly what I wanted to do, and then. Um, I, I shouldn't. I shouldn't. I shouldn't say Schreider said that was intractable, but they said like that would be difficult um, because the the kids that come, um, you know, Schreider's Hospital is one of the maybe the only, um, not the only. It's 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 there are a number of kids that come from quite a distance to come and get treated and seen, and um, they usually have um, annual visits, so. When they're here, their time is fairly is it very is very precious. Like there, there's you know a fairly small amount of time that they have um, to do our studies. And one thing that I I desperately wanted to do was I think get at get at that question is like you know if you can track these things over time, not just you know have one one snapshot or data point, but if you can look at this over multiple years, um, you know, and and also take into account the um, the experience with the prosthetic devices. Like how how do all these things um, basically you know interact and how do they intersect to um, to not only affect the control but also the representation? I I mean I think it's fascinating. I think it's really really interesting questions. And I think we have we're bu we're building the ability to to answer that question. Um, as um, I forgot who told me this, but you know you 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 have you have to start. You have to start slowly and build towards that. It's not something we can just do right now, um, but but it's something that I want to answer. And you know, one of the things that we have thought about doing in the future is not just doing a um, uh, cross-sectional study. So right now, you know, what, what we what we're planning on doing is a cross-sectional study where we're looking at you know kids at these different ages, but also a longitudinal study. So like do both at the same time. So like um, not only get them at these different ages, but also look at them over three or four years. Um, my hope is that we can try to do that in a year or so, um, but it's definitely something that right now um, we have to, we kind of have to build the, not, not just the infrastructure, but really, I mean, more or less the trust. I mean, like part of the reason, and maybe I didn't emphasize this enough when I was, when I was talking about it, part of the reason that we've been so successful is because of the um, remarkable relationships that um, Shriners Hospital has with the kids that come. And that their parents, you know, and the kids trust us to like actually, you know, conduct these studies. The the graduate students that I, I mentioned um, towards the end have also been remarkably, um, you know, aware of you know how to how to how to interact with kids and how to how to do these studies. So um, that's just to give a sense. Like I, I know everyone on this call probably knows this. It's it's a difficult thing to do. It's you know it, it's definitely something I want to accomplish. But um, for for all the reasons I gave. It's just something that you know it's going to take time to build towards being able to address that. But it is an excellent question, and it's exactly how I started writing my proposal, uh, you know, a few months ago. And I, I realized after discussions with Shriners that it was probably fairly impractical right now. But it's I'm hopeful it's something that we can do in a year or so. Yeah, 
I'm just giving totally unsatisfactory answers to all the questions. They're excellent oh, questions. <laughs> what you've done already is tremendous. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, I think I think we'll uh, maybe close. That's a great uh, place to to close out mm -hmm. for today. Um, I really want to thank Dr. Joyner again. Uh, it was a fantastic talk and. Um, Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you for inviting me. This is this is great. Really fun.